This is the 21st century, and race, together with gender and even class, can be very seductive tools of propaganda. For what is so often overlooked and what matters, I believe, above all, is the class one serves. Obama's very presence in the White House appears to reaffirm the moral nation. He's a marketing dream, but like Calvin Klein or Benetton, he's a brand that promises something special, something exciting, almost risque, as if he might be radical, as if he might enact change. He makes people feel good. He's a postmodern man with no political baggage, and all that's fake. It's the two-headed one-party system. It's the, it's the Washington Wrestling Federation. But unlike the World Wrestling Federation, where you know the game is rigged, but you still have your villains and heroes, the people actually think there's a difference between the Republicans and the Democrats. They play the game out in front about how they dislike each other, get together after the show, and do their dirty deals. Earlier this week, the Electronic Privacy Information Center won a Freedom of Information ruling from the U.S. Marshal Service, revealing that certain government agencies are storing the images from naked body scanners at security checkpoints, despite previous government assurances to the contrary. The U.S. Marshal Service has admitted storing full body scan images of people entering the federal courthouse in Orlando, Florida. The federal agency hasn't stored just a few. They've got more than 35,000 images on record. And it's no surprise that this is now raising new questions about these scanners, the ones being used at airport security checkpoints as well. We have some samples of the images saved by the Marshall's millimeter wave machine in Orlando. They aren't particularly revealing, but what is so disturbing to privacy advocates is that they were saved at all after so many assurances from government officials that the machines would not do that. Here's Homeland Security Secretary Janet Napolitano in March. The machines are not set to store uh, images. They're not set to transmit images, uh, out, such as the one you referred mm -hmm. to. We're really talking about you know, older iterations of the technology. Sure, but, but, but we want to deal with those as we go through the, the implementation. Sure, but can you guarantee, Madam Secretary, again, that we will never, ever hear a story of somebody inappropriately storing or transmitting these images? Look, I'm going to tell you, we are, not, we are not retaining, we are not keeping. They're not designed for that at all. Right, but that doesn't sound like an unequivocal no. The scanners were introduced earlier in the year in the wake of the hysteria surrounding the so-called underwear bomber last Christmas. They were marketed as a way of preventing such terror attacks in the future, but such rhetoric fails to take into account the fact that the underwear bomber bypassed all regular screening procedures, even managing to board the plane despite being a known terror suspect because the State Department was ordered not to revoke his visa by one of the U.S. intelligence agencies. Despite the startling nature of this admission by Undersecretary of State for Management Patrick F. Kennedy in testimony before the House Homeland Security Committee in January of this year, the fact that Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib was protected and allowed to board the plane by the very agencies that were supposedly watching him has not been mentioned once on network news in the U.S. Nor was the fact that Muttalib himself appeared surprised by the fire and actually helped to put it out reported on by mainstream news, except for NPR. Nor was the fact that the scanners had already been ordered in advance and were being prepared to be rolled out in January anyway mentioned in stories about the need for increased safety at airports. Nor was Columbia University professor Dr. David Brenner's warning that the machines deliver 20 times more cancer-causing radiation than originally thought widely reported. Nor were the financial ties of people like former Homeland Security Chief Michael Chertoff to the companies that manufacture the scanners disclosed when Chertoff was making media appearances, extolling the need for such scanners. Last month it was revealed that all passengers at El Paso International Airport are being put through the scanners as the primary screening method. While groups like Epic continue to be at the forefront of fighting the use of these machines, widespread public apathy about the subject means that the government will continue rolling the machines out in more airports over the coming year. In other news, Australian TV News is beginning to ask serious questions about the practice of mass medicating the public without consent by adding fluoride to the water supply. But first, 
We consume it every day with the reassurance from our health authorities that it is doing us good. The truth is fluoride is a poison and adding it to our drinking water is an evolving social experiment started 40 years ago. Now one of the world's top fluoride experts has issued a grim warning about what it could be doing to our health and that of unborn children. Yet as Frank Pengello reports, you'll get a different spin from dentists and health bureaucrats. We consider that as a poison. Why should a poison be in drinking water? The poison is fluoride. It's there because government health bureaucrats and dentists tell us it's for our common good, for reducing tooth decay, and at levels which won't harm you. That doesn't wash with Professor A.K. Shashila. They should realise it's the poisonous substance. It doesn't promote health. It is, it is a disease-causing agent, and the fluoridation should be stopped as early as possible. Professor Shashila is one of the world's leading experts on fluoride. Her own extensive research, along with 70 years of data in India, backs up what she's saying, and it's most disturbing. I would consider the, the, a pregnant mother taking fluoride-contaminated products, I'm using the word products, which includes water, toothpaste, black tea, uh, uh, processed food products which has fluoride. Any liquid? Any liquid, anything. At a, where her urinary fluoride is high, she is going to cause a lot of damage to the fetus, the growing embryo, the infant which is going to be born. The report comes as study after study continues to confirm what has long been known that sodium fluoride is a neurotoxin that attacks the central nervous system, causes cancer, increases likelihood of bone fractures, damages the liver and kidney, disrupts the thyroid gland, lowers IQ, causes dental fluorosis, and, when ingested, does not help prevent cavities. Despite the public health disaster that is the fluoridated water experiment, and despite the ethical concerns raised by adding a neurotoxin to the water supply without the informed consent of the public, and without knowing the specific health record or circumstances of each person who is ingesting this forced medication, researchers are now raising the specter of adding other drugs to the water supply in the name of public health. Recently, bioethicist and medical historian Jacob Appel made headlines for his call to use lithium and other cognitive enhancers in the public water supply to reduce suicide or produce other beneficial effects, citing the success of the fluoridated water idea as a basis for such action. On a positive note, more people are resisting the use of such forced medication tactics. The Dayton Daily News reported that last Thursday that a group of teenagers in Huber Heights, Ohio has formed an action group to petition their city council to remove fluoride from their local water supply. Similar groups are popping up all across America, Australia, and other handful of nations that actually practice water fluoridation. In our top story this week, Intelligence analyst and Washington Times columnist Jeff Stein penned a column last Tuesday confirming that the CIA has made fake videos of Osama bin Laden. The admission comes in a story about U.S. intelligence plans to set up Saddam Hussein by creating fake tapes of an actor portraying Hussein having sex with a young boy. In that story, Stein notes, quote, the agency actually did make a video purporting to show Osama bin Laden and his cronies sitting around a campfire, swigging bottles of liquor and savoring their conquests with boys, one of the f former CIA officers recalled, chuckling at the memory. The actors were drawn from some of us darker-skinned employees, he said." End quote. The article then goes on to note that the CIA unit in charge of the operation, the Office of Technical Services, gave up on the project and it was then taken up by the military. This information further corroborate, corroborates what has already been revealed about signs that the Psychological Warfare Division of the Pentagon has been releasing fake Osama bin Laden tapes at regular intervals since 9-11. Some of the more infamous examples of those faked videos include a video of bin Laden that was supposedly released by Al-Qaeda in 2006, despite the fact that the exact footage had aired several months previously in The Road to Guantanamo, the Michael Watt Winterbottom docudrama, and a 2004 video purportedly showing bin Laden, which was exactly identical to a video released in 2007. In 2007, computer security consultant Neil Krawitz revealed at a security conference that an analysis of quantization tables in JPEGs extracted from As Sahab videos showed that the Al-Qaeda watermarks were inserted at the same time as Intel Center, a U.S.-based contractor which sells and distributes footage of terrorist groups. 
Intel Center CEO Ben Vensky was the former director of intelligence at VeriSign company iDefense, where he served with Jim Melnick, a 16-year veteran of the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency. Melnick specialized in psychological operations and had previously been assigned to the office of Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld. Stein's latest revelations merely offer further confirmation of the U.S. intelligence and military involvement in creating fake bin Laden tapes. Both the CIA and the Defense Department have yet to comment on this developing story. In other news this week, CBS is under fire for attempting to depict all those who question the official government position on geoengineering or the safety of fluoridated drinking water as anti-American conspiracy theorists. I got a little intel on Professor Scott. He has a history of espousing various conspiracy theories. Sharing them with his students got him into a little trouble. Every university has at least one unconventional professor. Oh, come on, Peyton. This guy's ideas here are totally anti-American. Look at this. Water fluoridation, tsunami bombs, chemtrails. Numerous scientific studies spanning back to the beginning of the water fluoridation program itself have confirmed that sodium fluoride is detrimental to human health.